What got me through my awkward teen years was belonging to a science fiction club. I have met some of my best friends through that. After two years of college, I did what any sensible country boy would do. I left for the big city. Sometimes I think I'm a 12-year-old boy trapped in a woman's body, and I go sit in the corner and read my comic books and watch football, and that's how it works. I am basically an old hippie. I read too much and I write too little. I grew up in the foothills of the Rocky Mountain. Hello. Welcome to The Far Away Nearby. I'm your host, DJ Sarsage, and this evening I am joined by our co-host, Sue. Hello. How are we all this evening? Well, uh, we're doing fine, and um, tonight uh, we will not have our third party Heidi Heidi is actually putting out a fire on the Death Star so um, (laughs) she has let me know that uh, she's going to do her best to make it the next time but um, unforeseen circumstances prevailed so here we are so so, um, getting right into things we're going to talk about how our weeks went how was your week Sue? Well, it was not too bad. Uh, Monday, I was the the doctor, and he's going to let me have a brand new left shoulder sometime this month. And that's a really good thing, because then my arm won't hurt. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Now, has that been bothering you for a while? It has been. And that's the... I have had my right shoulder and both of my knees replaced as well so my mother-in-law had her knee replacement done oh i want to say a year ago Mm -hmm. Um, and of course she's just waiting for when she'll have to get her next one done but (laughs) um you know my my other half takes after his mother so he is wondering um you know, what he can do to avoid that. And I guess they say that one of the first introductions to that uh, world of wonder is having injections. Uh, It can be. Um, When I was in my 30s, they gave me injections, gold injections. But I think if... Your mother-in-law has arthritis, and your significant other takes after her, that he's not going to, unless they develop something new and exciting, he's probably not going to miss out on the knee replacements, because it's usually arthritis that causes that. So we should get in on a layaway plan. Wouldn't hurt and, and keep keep really fine insurance. Now you you were saying that you got gold injections. Are you sure there was one gold schlager? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they were. They don't do them. They don't do gold injections anymore. But they used to. Oh, well, that's they, that's that's. They, what, <laughs> oh, I was just going to say they now use the. Um, Oh, I can't remember what it is. Is it like silicone or? <laughs> yes, they use this the silicone or silicon or whatever injections instead of the gold. I was going to say something cheesy and say, well, that you know, those injections were why you're such a gem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's sweet of you. <laughs> and it could be. You never can tell. I, I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> so um okay so the which part of your week was that again <laughs> well that was probably that was probably the well that was monday and that was probably mm-hmm. the best thing and possibly also the worst thing because mm-hmm. there is some amount of pain that comes with the surgery but but it it, in the long run, it's a really good thing to have happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's it's interesting how our um, our how our peaks and valleys all <laughs> seem to parallel. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, um, 
my week was quite interesting. I'm in the Northeast, and we were visited by a not-so-kind woman named Olympia, who decided to drop about two feet of snow in our hinterlands here. Oh, yes, I recall that. <laughs> yeah, and, um, well, I, uh, I made myself go to work, and, um, uh, well, let's just say the candy shop never closes, <laughs> and um, I decided I was going to get up and try to leave for work early, and on a given day, sometimes I might have to leave 15 minutes early if I get an alert on my phone saying that there's some sort of a, a traffic incident, so that's yeah. that's not uncommon. Uh, doesn't make me happy, but I accept it. it but because I reward myself if I leave early, you know, I'll go through a drive-through and get myself a nice coffee and something. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the greater reward, reward is that I get to keep my job. But um, um, yeah. <laughs> on this particular day, I was leaving for work about thirty minutes early, and I called the. Um, the person in charge of scheduling for my department. And, of course, as happens from time to time, she said, well, I'm sorry, but there's no available time right now being offered. And uh, of course, I just, just beside myself, I'm, really? Oh, okay, well, <laughs> at least I've <laughs> technically made the effort. Um, yeah. Not that that accounts for a whole lot unless, you know, um, what are they? I'm not. I forget what it's called. Force majeure uh, prevails. And um, anyways, I got. Uh, I left home about 30 minutes early, and somehow managed to be just slightly over an hour late to work. But um, because Olympia had dropped two feet of snow, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I uh, had at least two detours on my way to work in that I, sl- I sensed the traffic pattern and people were slowing down and people were making U-turns. And oh. I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder... You don't want to go that way. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, curiosity got the better of me and I thought, I wonder why they're turning around. So I, I waited for a couple minutes, and I said, you know, in that couple of minutes, I don't think I've moved even a car length or two. So I, I, I might want to check out their strategy. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. turned around and got to that traffic light, and I thought to myself, I know I just need to go north and west, so I'll just get on some of these side roads and... <laughs> I ended up driving around a, um, a landfill, and I knew it was there, but I assumed that since that's sort of a business industrial area, that the roads would have been better maintained in a storm, because, you know, there's going to be uh, 18 wheelers driving on that, but no, I was probably... <laughs> down to about 15 miles an hour with my hazard lights on because it was a skating rink. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember at one point I got to uh, a part of town that uh, you know was was fairly traveled. Yeah. And it, it was an intersection. Not in the city, mind you. This was still in the suburbs. But I yeah. had pulled up to the uh, the light and there was a car off to the side that had gotten itself into the curb or the ditch but a tow truck had already shown up to help well next to that car actually pulled up to the light so in the intersection essentially this driver had gotten out of their car for some reason was standing next to it and on their phone. And I gathered this person was either friends or related to the person being helped by the tow truck. Mm-hmm. But I don't see why it was still necessary for them to be outside of their car and on their phone blocking the turning lane. <laughs> 
unfortunately, there was no one coming from the other direction, so several of us took it upon ourselves <laughs> to enter the oncoming lane just to make our way around her. Yeah. And if ever there was a moment that I wanted to get out and take off my shoe, I think that was it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the American way, you know, to oh. stand in the middle of the road and be on your phone mm. and not worry about what other people are doing. I, You know, I, I almost wanted to ask her if she was helping direct traffic. <laughs> <laughs> but the ironic part about it is that when I got to work at the candy shop, the person that got to make the decision that we were going to close early that day was out of state in a southern climate. Oh. This is their actual regular um, building assignment, but they're in charge of my department, so... So there, somebody from out of state has to make the call. <laughs> that it's okay that you close early. Yeah. And I, I was beside myself when I was on my way to work because I had the radio on. Mm-hmm. A- and I, you know, I live in the country a little, and um, I got a little more than halfway to work before it was announced on the radio that the county sheriff had declared a travel ban. Oh well, yeah. And I'm just thinking to myself, you know, the weather is worse back home. I might as well continue going to work. Yeah. (laughs) So that was the low point of my week. (laughs) Um, I think probably the high point of my week actually happened before that Valentine's weekend. Um, I got to spend the whole weekend with my other half and... Um, while that in itself was wonderful, I wish that we had gotten more done around the house. <laughs> <laughs> we had bought new pillows, and he was excited about them, because mm-hmm. they were memory foam pillows. Yeah. But, but for some reason, he forgot his tendency to have neck issues, because, well, he was used to the pillow he had, and... When you try new things out, there's an adjustment period. Mm -hmm. So, of course, these wonderful pillows that I had no issues with (laughs) caused someone neck pain. (laughs) Oh, no. So, (laughs) So my weekend where I was expecting to get things done ended up being, oh, my neck, my neck. (laughs) Yes, well... Perhaps you should have handed him some Aleve or some Motrin or (laughs) or something. Well, and that's the thing. Years ago, I bought him this lovely massage pillow that's Mm -hmm. meant for the neck. It has heat and massage, but he insists that while it's wonderful, it actually um, doesn't improve things. It's like a Band-Aid I guess is it's not really the right terminology, I understand, but he seems to think that it doesn't actually make the problem go away. It just masks it for a little while. Well, yeah, it wouldn't make the problem go away. But, you know, as they say, um, the surest way to forget about <laughs> one pain is to start another. Well, yeah, um, but... Unless they can resolve whatever it is that causes his neck pains, uh, there's not much that's going to make that pain go away. Right. And so if there's something that will relieve it, make him forget it for a while, Mm -hmm. seems reasonable to me. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, when he was a kid, he used to be the sort that would get into scrapes. He... um, like to go skateboarding, mm-hmm. and he worked at an amusement park, and uh, he actually had one incident when he was young that his family went bowling, and, um, well, just because of his dumb luck, he almost lost his finger bowling. Um, he uh, had been holding the ball, and I- I'm not sure what you call it, is it serving when you when you roll the bowl down the lane in bowling? 
I have no idea. We, Not having we, to hold. He he went to let go of the bowling ball and his finger was stuck. Oh my god! And uh, apparently, he um he somehow tore part of his finger that was holding the the ball. Mm-hmm. So there was, I guess, there might have been nerve damage, but um, that's that's that just uh, summarizes my other half's childhood. He had a few scrapes and bumps, and he just dusts himself off and carries on like nothing happened. <laughs> um, there's been times where I've he's had a day off at work at home, mm-hmm. and there's been a home improvement project plan, and I have to come home wondering if I'm going to find him laying on the floor or something, <laughs> because he has no feeling in parts of his body, like the hand that was injured. Oh, he, yeah. You know, he, he he can hold things that are hot because the sensation is gone in that part of his hand. And he has actually put a screw through his hand before and thought nothing of it because it didn't hurt. That's not cool. <laughs> no. I, I I have to operate, you know, with babysitter rules. I have to say, please don't do those things while I'm not at home. And please promise not to injure yourself while I'm at home. Because <laughs> if I have to be responsible for taking you to the emergency room, I can't promise I'm not going to pass out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is ironic, considering the fact that I was raised by a nurse. But yes, it is ironic. But yes, uh, Valentine's weekend was the high point of the last week. Trying to remember if we did something special for dinner that night. We didn't end up going. Oh, that's it. Uh, instead of um, spending money and going out to dinner, because we at one point we had discussed the possibility of Valentine's weekend being a weekend out of town, possibly in a hotel room. Mm -hmm. But we decided that since we both had recently had expenses such as car, uh, I had to get a new muffler, um, that it might be better for us to plan a nice meal at home. So we had uh, one of my husband's favorite meals, which is corned beef and cabbage. Ooh. And... That's wonderful. mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to know, or to learn maybe, that uh, you know many people mistake it as being a traditional Irish dish when it's actually something like pizza, where it's an American invention. Well, yes, we invented it. We invent most of the traditional things from other countries. <laughs> <laughs> we'll rewrite your history. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, that's one of his favorite things is corned beef and cabbage. And when we told his mom what we were making, she said, it's not St. Patrick's Day. It's not for a while. <laughs> and, and our response to that was, well, it's practice then. Yeah, that, but, that, that's good. So, but that was the highlight of my <laughs> last week. So, um, we're about to enter a section that I like to call Talk About Town. And this is the uh, part of our show where we'll discuss any uh, feedback that we've received, your uh, your voicemails, your emails, your tweets. There are a lot of ways to interact with us. And recently, I was lucky enough that a couple of Pride 48 shows um, featured some messages from us and so the word is getting out about our little show and um, one of those is a show called It's All About Me the me stands for Mark and Ed and this is a project that we have um, amongst our co-hosts here in the future we're going to be listening to Pride 48 shows that maybe uh, each of us hadn't listened to before to try to expose ourselves to some new programming and uh, as a result of that we'll also be sharing on the air which new shows we've listened to but um, It's All About Me is a show 
uh, that is co-hosted by two gentlemen that live in New Mexico. Name, uh, their names are Mark and Ed. And Mark and Ed had asked for calls and feedback on their show. They were doing a new episode that weekend, and it ended up being Super Bowl weekend. So, of course, my two cents was that for those of you who weren't watching the Super Bowl, because you aren't into the sports ball, that you might be watching either the Puppy Bowl or the Kitten Bowl, and a uh, voicemail that I left them. I, I kind of got um, a little suggestive in it, because anyways, I said that um, possibly s- somewhere there is a leather bar that has a different kind of puppy bowl going on. (laughs) And there are two podcasters out there who are well known to be interested in the leather community. One's name is Big Fatty. Mm -hmm. And the other podcaster that is um, active in the leather community, Gay Country West. And another show that I left a message for recently is one that I've been listening for to for quite a few years. It's called Pod is My Co-Pilot. Um, my voicemail was a uh, response to a recent episode of theirs. They like to give their episodes interesting names, and it's usually um, a... Uh, something that's been mentioned in the episode. So the, <laughs> they'll be making conversation and someone will find something funny and they decide that that's going to be the name of that episode. Um, so this particular episode ended up being called Penguin Belly Peng- Penguin Belly Penguin. Uh, in this particular episode, they had talked about making a, um, a meal that went along with the movie. For this particular one, it was a Chevy Chase movie that uh, he co-starred with Goldie Hawn. I'm I'm timeless with my taste in movies, and yeah. uh, I, I attribute that to my dad's love of movies. The movie was called Seems Like Old Times, and the storyline was that Chevy Chase was looking for a place to hide out, and he looked up his old his ex-wife, who of course has since moved on and more importantly, is now married to an up-and-coming politician. Okay. And um, she happened to be making this meal that um, uh, was her husband's favorite, and it's called chicken pepperoni. Okay. And um, anyways, uh, on Pot is My Co-Pilot, they were talking about um, watching this movie and making chicken pepperoni. So I let him know that we are big Goldie Hawn fans in our house and that our tortoise shell kitty is named Goldie because she's both sweet and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and I named my car Sonny Davis because one of my favorite Goldie Hawn movies is Protocol. So the, that was the talk about town. And, of course, um, there are several ways to interact with our show, and we'll be reviewing those at the end of the program. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to our topics of the week. I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to you, Sue. Is there something that you found interesting in the last week that you'd like to talk about? In the past few weeks, we've lost a number of are of icons that are probably more arc icons of my age than uh, since many of them are singers or actors you may have related to them as well uh, we lost David Boyd of course and everybody loves David <laughs> oh yeah I could tell a quick story about that when I was a kid I didn't have um a CD player, I would borrow CDs from the public library and I would transfer mm-hmm. them to cassette to listen to in study hall. <laughs> and uh, David Bowie's album um, that had China Girl on it was one of the ones that I recorded. Yeah. And yeah, I can imagine. I <laughs> that 
that um, they, David Bowie sort of uh, everybody uh, it seems to have liked him, or at least part of his his work. Uh, Alan Rickman also died. Uh, these gentlemen were both 69, and Alan Rickman is a British actor, perhaps best known for playing Snape on in the Harry Potter, Potter movies. Mm-hmm. Movies. I can talk. <laughs> uh, we also lost Renee a- Angelil. Uh, who uh, was married to and managed mm-hmm. Celine Di- Dion. I can't talk today. <laughs> uh, he was 73, and he died of throat cancer. And I'm guessing that a lot of people missed that. I certainly did the first time around um, and only ran into this while I was uh, uh, looking these up to make to make uh, certain I got everybody. Uh, Dan Haggerty also died during this time period. Um, he played Grizzly Adams in the 1970s TV show. Uh, uh, he was 74. And Glenn Fry of the Eagles, uh, who was a, the co-founder and guitar player, was most recent. Well, except, of course, for Antonin Scalia. Of course, the Supreme Court Justice, who died just last weekend in a hotel room in Texas uh, from an apparent heart attack. He was 79, and of course, this has brought up a great political debate, which seems superfluous to me. But um, it, it just struck me that there were a lot of people that meant a great deal to me that have passed on in the last, I don't know, four weeks or less. And, and besides being rather sad, it, it makes me remember that uh, I'm not getting any younger, as, as my mother would have said. These people, I, I got to know many of them when uh, when I was an adolescent, uh, a just starting into the uh, university. So I guess that's all I really had to say about that. I just sort of wanted to to mention them just because they will be greatly missed. For my interesting topic for this week, I often listen to NPR during my work day at the candy shop. And during uh, one program, there was an interview with an author, and um, I'm going to go ahead and read part of this story. Um, The host, who's David Green, he hosts the program that is called NPR host David Green Talk to Author Diane Lebex about her new novel, Breaking Wild, which vividly mm-hmm. evokes Colorado's rugged back country. And um, in the interview, she discussed having lived in Colorado for a time. And in the uh, interview, she also mentioned that uh, during certain parts of the book, it was discussing some of her experiences. And um, it talked about her going hunting. And she discussed that uh, she was literally covered in elk pheromones as part of her hunting gear so that she could attract a male to hunt. And uh, the article says, the first thing you need to know about, um, the first thing you need to know about Diane Lebex, she loves the outdoors. She was living in Meeker, Colorado, hunting, hiking, writing books until life took a turn. She got divorced and said goodbye to her beloved Colorado to take a teaching job in New Hampshire to support her three sons. And the article goes on to mention that um, she met a logger who was a forester, and they got married and fell in love, and he eventually passed away from brain cancer. And um, the book is very interesting because it discusses her having grown up in Colorado, and it talks about 
being an outdoors person, and it talks about hunting. And one of the points of the interview, her interviewer asks her about something that might be on the the mind of people um, as a social topic, and one that that being, um, how do you discuss the ethics of hunting with somebody who might be, for example, a vegetarian? And while I I don't know that she necessarily um, provided a full argument for that case, I thought it was an interesting topic to bring up just simply because I think both Sue and I grew up in, for the most part, rural areas. I uh, am not opposed to it. I am not sure I see the middle ground so much. I understand that our wildlife population is kept under control with the use of hunters. Now, you have to understand that as a child, I grew up in a family that was becoming poor and were essentially downwardly mobile in an era where the entire country was upwardly, was moving on an upwardly mobile basis. And when I was a child, it's possible that we would not have had a lot of meat to eat had my brother not been a hunter. And he hunted throughout high school, and then he went away to the Navy, and he hunted again when he came back. It's always interesting when I go to visit my family because I have that physical separation. When I get out to the country, I'm sometimes taken aback when I forget what life is like out there. When my brother, for example, will come to my sister's home and he'll be wearing some gear from hunting or he's got one of his kids with him. And these are, for the most part, young persons who are not even in their early 20s. So, Hunting is not something that I have a lot of objections to. I can be quite thankful for it for for my childhood i think that unlike when they came out in the in the 18 somethings and killed all the buffalo or not all the buffalo but killed many of our bison uh and just left them to rot on the plains because what they wanted to do was to shoot them and, and not use them hunting is is a sport which utilizes the carcass of of animals when you think of a hunter or at least when i think of a hunter i think of someone who is going to to recover the the and the meat and and the hide and all of those things and when the game and parks people find that they must cull a herd they will frequently take that uh, take those the uh, the animals that they have had to cull and take them to uh, have them prepared butchered etc and given to uh, poor folk in our communities i like to think that i understand <laughs> that a, a part of hunting is the tradition involved behind it, possibly even history. You know, we want to pass on a tradition and understanding that this is how the way of life used to be and that we don't want to forget this because, you know, should there be some sort of a uh, event you know, um, ergo zombie apocalypse, <laughs> we need to be able to provide for ourselves. And, and certainly, I can see the merit in that, that, you know, if we do become too dependent upon prepackaged things, you know, we somehow lose our humanity because we don't know how to grow tomatoes or, you know, how to pick peas or what have you 
and you know we still have these capabilities it's just i i don't know that it necessarily has to involve teaching a 12 year old boy that it's a natural thing for dad to hang up a defenseless animal in the backyard and gut it and and i find it interesting that you know on the subject of hunting in general that while certainly there can be the argument that there is uh you know, cruelty and inhumaneness involved. You, 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 there is also the aspect that um, we have become ignorant as a society where we allow anything to come across our plate just because we could pick it up at the supermarket. We don't bother to look at the labels or, you know, do the research <laughs> if this was done safely. I mean, a while back, I saw a you know a, a home improvement show, a real estate show, where their clients were a Jewish family. Yes. And of course, I d- you know I haven't been exposed to a lot of Jewish culture. I don't quote unquote have a token Jewish friend, but I um, you know I'm not knowledgeable enough about um, the culture and the religion to understand that part of that is that certain items in the kitchen are not allowed to touch each other because yeah the idea of cleanliness being close to godliness well that and and you're not allowed to consume meat and milk mm-hmm. off the same dishes or at the same meal and um, in this family one of the requirements was that their kitchen was to have separate dishwashers yes some people are do or i understand some people are beginning to do that now mm-hmm. so it, i just found it interesting that you know not having been exposed to somebody of that faith that i didn't know that the their religious practices actually dictated mm. that it's a good idea to do things like this i i found the idea interesting of this book because in part, I, I think that having grown up with such a strong female influence in my house, I have two sisters, and I have a I had a mother who was essentially the breadwinner of our household. <laughs> there is a very independent woman spirit about this author and the story that she tells, and this book is actually what she called autobiographical fiction. <laughs> And I, yeah. I think that may be a genre of its own that I'm probably not fam- very familiar with. But as I understand it, these are stories that she writes with some of her own personal insight. Because I think that um, just given the woman's background that she had lived in Colorado, um, mm-hmm. it might be a book worth looking into. I- Out in the fall. Thank you for listening to The Far Away Nearby. You can find our fan page on Facebook. Our email is tfnpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at tfndj. Or leave us a message at 720-230-6919.